The Epilepsy Foundation acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this property stands. We respectfully recognise Elders both past and present. So I'm Terry O'Brien. I'm a epileptologist. That's a neurologist that specialises in the uh, in the treatment of people with epilepsy. Um, I, my um, day job is that I'm the head of neurology at uh, the Alfred Hospital and also the head of department of neuroscience at Monash University. Um, and uh, I do um, research in discovering, trying to discover new and better treatments for people with epilepsy. Yeah, no, no, all epilepsies are not the same. Um, Epilepsy actually is not a single disease in itself. It's a uh, it's a symptom of many different brain conditions, some of which we uh, can easily recognise, um, such as someone with a brain tumour or, or a traumatic brain injury or a brain infection um, or some injury to the brain from a, a childhood uh, um, a problem. Um, then, uh, then it's easy to identify what the epilepsy is a symptom of. In about 80% of people with new onset epilepsy, we don't identify any underlying cause, um, but even in those people there's likely many different causes, we just are not good enough at, uh, at finding them. And no one person's epilepsy is the same as another person's. We're all individuals in, uh, in, in, in many different ways, and epilepsy is just one example of that. It'll depend what, where your seizures come from in the brain, the symptoms they, uh, they manifest. It depends, depends where they spread to in the brain in terms of the symptoms that manifest. Um, some people have very frequent seizures. Some people have seizures that don't occur very often at all. Some people have very major convulsion ulcer type seizures that are obvious and uh, very dangerous. Other people have much more subtle seizures that maybe nobody else can tell except for them. So everybody's individual. But there does tend to be a consistent pattern within one individual person. So their seizures, uh, and they may have more than one type of seizure, uh, but their seizures tend to be pretty similar from seizure to seizure. For most people, there's not just a scanner you can put them through. Like for bowel cancer, it's it's easy. You have a colonoscopy, they see the bowel cancer. It's 100% specific and sensitive. If your colonoscopy is negative, you don't have bowel cancer. Epilepsy is not like that because it's a, a transient disturbance of, uh, of electrical functioning in the brain. So if you're not actually having a seizure right in that moment, there is actually no definitive test that can say you have epilepsy or don't. So largely it's on the clinical history that we take from the person with epilepsy, um, witnesses to the seizures and, um, and, and family members, and complementing that with, uh, with a variety of tests which help increase the prior probability of epilepsy and also help us understand what type of epilepsy it is and whether they, the, the seizure is more likely to occur again and whether it's likely to require treatment and whether that treatment's likely to work. So the tests that your doctor will send you off for, which will be quite a few scans and brainwave recordings, etc., largely are around um, trying to understand better the nature of the epilepsy rather than diagnosing whether you have epilepsy or don't. That's primarily done on the basis of the history of the events um, and the witnesses' descriptions. So the treatments are pretty, um, a, a, a pretty blunt instrument, to be honest. Um, there is this era of precision medicine, which has dawned where we are now trying to target treatment specifically for um, subtypes of different conditions and the best field for that is cancer. If you have a, a, a breast cancer now, your doctor will take the tumour and look at the molecular diagnosis with genetics and pathology and give you a drug that's specifically targeted to that or melanoma. Epilepsy, we'd like to do that, but we're not there yet. That requires quite a bit more research. So the, the, the treatments we use are a, a, a group of drugs called anti-epileptic drugs or now better termed anti-seizure drugs, which are very, very um, much a blunt instrument. They work across most types of epilepsy to a similar degree, um, but they don't work in everybody in the way they should. About 50% about of people will get seizure control with the first drug we try, um, and with the second drug, uh, probably about another 15% or so. Um, and then as we try more and more drugs, the proportion of patients who get control uh, rapidly decreases. And after you've tried three or more drugs, if they're appropriate drugs and appropriate doses, if you're still having seizures, it's it's very likely that uh, no other medications will control the seizures completely, and that's generally we recommend a specialist, subspecialist assessment in a comprehensive epilepsy centre, um, and look at other forms of treatment such as epilepsy surgery, which can um, make people seizure-free and whom the medications don't work. 
all drugs, every, even a Panadol, can have side effects. So there's always potential side effects with any medication. And about 50% of people will experience some sort of side effects when they first start a medication. Uh, maybe even more when and look at the very mild transit side effects. Uh, but for most people, once we get the, they get used to the medication, you get the right dose, because it might be the first medication is not the right one for you and your doctor needs to try a second or third medication till they find the right drug for you. But once you find the right drug, most people actually um, can take their medication without significant side effects. But it's a matter of working with your doctor to, uh, to not just accept how you're feeling on one drug, but actually find the right fit. The most common time to develop epilepsy the first time um, is in when you're over 60. People think of epilepsy as being a disease of children, and of course it can occur in children, but in fact the most common time to develop epilepsy for the first time is when you're over 60. And older people are generally taking other medications for other conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, et cetera, um, ischemic heart disease. And yes, there can be interactions between some of the medications, particularly some of the older medications. Um, so that's something your doctor would be very aware of and would be counseling you about. Some of the, many of the newer medications have less drug interactions, um, so that's less of a problem, but old drugs potentially can interact in one way or another. The anti-epilepsy drugs are not the be-all and end-all in themselves. As I said, in at least 30% of people, they still keep having seizures despite taking the medications. Um, generally, though, the alternative treatments are not, al not an alternative to medications. They're complementary to medications. So um, most people can't get complete seizure control from non-medical approaches. But non-medical approaches can complement the medication to help you get achieve seizure control. Um, and the general non-medical approaches are good lifestyle, avoiding uh, sleep deprivation, avoiding um, sit, uh, stimulant drugs, party drugs that, uh, that activate the brain in particular, um, uh, getting a good diet. Um, there are some, um, there is an increasing use of uh, variants of the ketogenic diet in uh, epilepsy and the, that can be a very effective complement. It doesn't replace anti-epileptic drugs, it's not an alternative to anti-epileptic drugs, but in people who are having difficulty getting control or experiencing side effects when they have a lot of anti-epileptic medications, it can be a, a very good way of achieving control and maybe reducing the amount of medications you need to take. Um, there's a lot of interest in medical cannabis, of course, and medical cannabis is in a, in a similar boat. Um, it's a very helpful complement by itself. It rarely provides complete seizure control. It's a pretty weak anti-epileptic drug, but it's usually quite well tolerated and if you're able to get some, get hold of medical cannabis, which is actually difficult at the moment in Australian, uh, the Australian health system, but if you are able to get that, then it can be a useful complement to your anti epileptic medication, helping seizure control and potentially reducing the amount of medication you need to take. Yeah, Sudep is really important to talk about. And for a long time, you know, when I first started practicing, um, people, neurologists would rarely bring this up with patients um, for uh, because they didn't want to scare people, basically. Um, and also, I think there was a relatively uh, um, a lack of understanding even amongst neurologists and medical professions about how uh, important SUDEP is. Um, I always bring it up at the first consultation with my patients, but I bring it up in a very much a, 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 a measured way and a balanced way and try not to, uh, to, I try to, to, to make them aware of it, but without um, making people uh, overly frightened. Um, and the important point about SUDEP is that it is actually in any individual relatively uncommon. And so, you know, people do, shouldn't leave the room or get on the internet and think they're, they're going to die any moment. Um, but if you look at, uh, at people over a lifetime and a group of people with epilepsy, it is one of the most common causes of sudden death in our community and particularly in people under 50, it is the most common cause of sudden death. Um, and there's estimated up to 200 Australians a year die of SUDEP. So across the population, it's a very important problem. The number one way to prevent SUDEP is to control your seizures. Um, so seizures, uh, seizure, seizure Uncontrolled seizures, particularly uncontrolled convulsive seizures, are associated with a, a much higher risk of SUDEP. People whose seizures are completely well controlled rarely die of SUDEP. So um, if when a person asks the best way to prevent it, well, it's to get a good neurologist, work with them to get the right treatment for you and take that treatment as prescribed um, and keep your seizures controlled and uh, your risk of SUDEP would be, uh, will be minimised.
Many people with epilepsy uh, also experience psychological symptoms. Um, those symptoms are, n are not a direct effect of the seizures, um, but might be an effect of what this condition coming out of the blue has done to their life, affecting their driving, relationships, etc. But we also understand that the actual biology of what, what causes epilepsy in many cases also seems to uh, increase the risk of uh, psychological conditions, particularly anxiety and depression. So it is very common in people with epilepsy, both at new diagnosis and also uh, when you've had epilepsy for, for many years. Um, and we work very closely with both psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, not every Everybody needs to see a psychologist or psychiatrist by any means. We really should be involving them more than we traditionally have. Um, and uh, one of the uh, initiatives we've uh, implemented at, uh, at our institution is that all patients, um, while they're sitting in the waiting room waiting to see the neurologist, fill out a questionnaire which, uh, which assesses uh, psychological stress and psychological symptoms and depression. Because um, often people, you know, they, when they see the neurologist, they're a bit reluctant to bring up about their psychological side of things. Um, they think the neurologist might not be interested. They're often rushed and busy clinics. And so this question questionnaire is actually quite good at capturing um, uh, uh, symptoms that patients are experiencing that they might not report. And many of those relate to, uh, to stress and anxiety. And uh, we use that as a trigger to, first, the neurologist to ask about it, and then secondly, to refer. We have a both a neuropsychologist and a neuropsychiatrist in our clinic recognising the very close um, relationship between the epilepsy and, uh, and psychological conditions. If you just focus on the seizures by themselves um, and the medical side of the seizures, you, you'll never get optimum outcomes. You need to look at, at, at the whole person, their whole lifestyle, their psychological state, their diet, exercise, um, their, their, their hobbies, their, their, their uh, occupation. Um, and you know that's why we we've established multidisciplinary clinics that have nurses, dietitians, psychologists, psychiatrists, as well as neurologists to try and um, and we work closely with our partner organisations at the Epilepsy Foundation and other other uh, community organisations to to provide that sort of that holistic care. Well, there's a lot of aspects of epilepsy we don't understand as well as we'd like. Um, I mentioned earlier that 80% uh, of people with newly diagnosed epilepsy actually don't have a good explanation for why the epilepsy is developed. So we need to understand more about what causes epilepsy. Uh, and then we do need to develop better treatments. Um, at the moment, 30% uh, of patients can't get their seizures controlled despite trying all the medications available. And they're the people who have the highest risk of injury, hospitalisation, disability, and of uh, sudden unexplained death, SUDEP. Um, and uh, so a lot of effort has now been put into uh, uh, to, uh, developing uh, and trying to develop better medical treatments. Um, we have epilepsy surgery, which can be very effective, but is applicable only to a, a small proportion of people with epilepsy um, and, uh, uh, and is very expensive and invasive and, um, and time consuming. So we're looking at trying to develop better medical treatments forms of treatments, be they uh, uh, tablets, um, uh, other forms of, uh, of treatments such as neurostimulation and uh, cellular therapies um, and, uh, and diets and, uh, and, and, uh, um, and non-medical approaches as well. We do in our clinic over 500 telehealth consultations a year. We're the largest in, in Australia, I think. So uh, telehealth is actually incredibly important. So one of the, I mean, I used to for many years travel to uh, several country centres uh, um, to do epilepsy clinics, and a, and a few of my colleagues still do that. Um, but uh, but largely uh, management of epilepsy is a specialised um, uh, uh, area. Um, it's not it's something that now many general neurologists don't feel completely comfortable with um, and is largely best managed by subspecialists in multidisciplinary teams um, in, uh, in, in epilepsy clinics. Now they're available at the big teaching hospitals um, but they're not generally available in rural areas. Um, so we've instituted a, a very uh, active telehealth program um, which allows us to uh, consult with patients no matter where they are in rural Victoria or across Australia Australia, many of our consultations across Australia, and that represents probably a third of our, or a quarter of our clinic is uh, is telehealth patients. Um, and the you know, really valuable thing about epilepsy in terms of telehealth or, or useful thing is that it's largely about um, about the history and talking to people about how they're they're going, what their uh, symptoms are, what their side effects are. You don't generally, particularly after the first consultation, need to examine someone. 
You might need to bring them down to the specialist centre for, for intensive investigation and, and we often would admit people for a week for a comprehensive evaluation if they're thinking of epilepsy surgery. But then you can do all the rest of the follow-up um, locally at their home via telehealth. So this allows the specialist expertise that previously was largely only accessible to people who lived in the city to be also available to people no matter where they live in the country. And in fact, we do telehealth with people who are overseas as well. Australians have moved overseas for a period of time and uh, continue to, uh, to, uh, to have their medical consultations through telehealth. So it's been really important. So the first message I try and give actually is a positive message. Um, most people with epilepsy, um, as much as you hear all the bad things, most people with epilepsy actually do very well. In fact, there's people um, with epilepsy in every strata of society, from professional footballers to parliamentarians to doctors, um, and to, uh, to people who are, who are serving you a coffee. Um, so for most people, you actually can live with epilepsy very well. But the critical thing is to get good specialist care and assessment so you get the right treatment and that you get do everything you possibly can to get your seizures controlled because seizure freedom is the uh, is the number one determinant of uh, of quality of life and also medical safety and uh, and risk um, of, of all other things um, and you should never accept even though for 30 percent of people we struggle to get seizure control we never accept not getting seizure freedom we're always trying something new and trying to get seizure freedom the second message I think is to uh, um, is to uh, to look at the psychological side of things because the second biggest determinant of quality of life is uh, is mood and anxiety, um, and that's often over ignored. So addressing the psychological side um, is the uh, is the other big message in terms of uh, managing your epilepsy. But try to start off with a positive message because the bottom line is most people actually do very well with epilepsy, with good care. Uh, but it's a partnership. It's not something your doctor can treat you. Your doctor can advise you how to treat your epilepsy. The person needs to take ownership of that. If they don't, um, then the epilepsy will never be controlled.